so bear with me. So playing in the dark. Whiteness in the literary imagination is a very thin volume. My copy clocks in at 91 pages. However, as I used to warn my students in the Toni Morrison seminar I designed and taught at the New School, tread lightly when faced with the author's brevity. Morrison is simply using economy, which means every word or turn of phrase counts. Same thing here. This text is dense and explosive in the simplicity of what it proposes. And this is it, quote, that readers of virtually all of American fiction have been positioned as white. I am interested to know what that assumption has meant to the literary imagination. Morrison is saying that no literature until fairly recently was designed for black people, nor did that literature have black people in mind. You might even begin to contemplate how fiercely guarded literacy was and how much of early writings by and about African Americans involve the struggle for literacy. And I'm thinking here about slave narratives um, by figures as diverse as Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass, but also poetry by Phyllis Wheatley. These texts were all produced for white readers. But in exploring literature, Morrison delivers another, another critique that lingers in the brain long after one finishes playing in the dark. The author writes, Living in a nation of people who decided that their worldview would combine agendas for individual freedom and mechanisms for devastating racial oppression presents a singular landscape for a writer. Though her focus is literature, Morrison suggests the impact of race, racism, and whiteness on the American psyche. In our time together this evening, I'm gonna be exploring Morrison's assertions through the lens of two early 20th century novels, Willa Cather's Safira and the Slave Girl, and Martha Gellhorn's Liana. I don't suppose that many of you have read these books. I might be the only person who's ever read them, and um, I hope that maybe someone else will read them after tonight. So I'm putting these novels in conversation with each other because of their complex use of mixed race female characters and what we may derive about national conversations on race. And through Gellhorn and Cather, I intend to show the diasporic connections of two white female authors working out their respective and related anxieties through mixed race female characters, which eventually enables them to quote, play in the dark. Before I go any further, I think it's important to define the first term and how I'm deploying it in this talk. Um, mixed race, um, as I'm thinking about it is the children that are produced as a result of relations between an individual who identifies as black and an individual who identifies as white. That is the context of the novels that I'm using, but I'm not suggesting that there aren't other types of mixed race individuals in the world. This is the context, however, that I am using it this evening. In 1990, Morrison delivered the William E. Massey lectures in the history of American civilization at Harvard. These lectures were revised and published in 1992 as the three essays within Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. In addition to Playing in the Dark, Morrison published in 1992 a collection of essays, Racing Justice, Engendering Power, Essays on Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas and the Construction of Social Reality, as well as a novel called Jazz, set largely in 1930s Harlem. So Morrison presents her readership with different avenues to consider race, which suggests the project of playing in the dark. In part, Morrison asserts that literary criticism had been providing incomplete readings of canonical literature as a result of a kind of universalized and normative whiteness. And I'm going to, of course, define whiteness for you. Whiteness is a construction um, that affords privileges to certain members of society, particularly the right to be normal, legitimate, and protected by the state. In other words, to quote anti-racism theorist Ibram Kendi, it is a racial crime to be yourself if you are not white in America. It is a racial crime not to look like yourself or empower yourself if you are not white. So I want to be very clear that I'm not speaking about white people or those who identify as white, though they might benefit most regularly from whiteness. So back to Morrison. Morrison is critiquing the ways that whiteness is legitimate, transcendent, and timeless. It is uncontested. She asserts that our national literature, 
and one could easily extend her ideas to other cultural productions like film, might very well be responses, quote, to a dark, abiding, signing Africanist presence. Morrison then focuses on the meaning of the presence of the black body in the literature of four celebrated white writers. Willa Cather, um, not, and the novel that she looks at is Saphir and the Slave Girl, published in 1940. She also examines Edgar Allan Poe's The Narrative of Ed, Ed Arthur Gordon Pym, published in 1838. Um, Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a classic, published in 1885. And two pieces by Ernest Hemingway, To Have and Have Not, uh, published in 1937, and the posthumously published The Garden of Eden, um, published in 1986. Morrison takes issue with the process that firmly establishes these writers within the literary canon of the United States while simultaneously discussing these texts as raceless and apolitical. She asserts that attempts by critics to remove race and politics from intellectual and artistic discussions are themselves racialist and political acts. How can they not be? In Playing in the Dark, Morrison argues that a black presence pervades the United States and is crucial to shaping its national identity, including its cultural productions. Very quickly, I am going to outline the three essays that comprise Playing in the Dark um, before turning to the novels that I wanna discuss uh, more fully. So it's divided into chapters or sections. So the first one, Black Matters, argues that the black body itself or imagined Africanisms may be the field against which characteristics that are typically associated with Americanness are set. What do I mean by, by Americanness or American characteristics? They are things like rugged individualism, morality, and innocence. But Morrison resituates the need for the discussions of race, not on the people who can't access these characteristics, but on those who gain privilege and power under implicit and explicit racialist discourses. In the second part, Romancing the Shadow, Morrison posits that early stirrings of an Africanist presence in the literature of the United States is central to our understanding of this literature. These moments of Africanism are marked by fear, dread, and haunting, rather than the more common social narrative located in optimism, confidence, and ingenuity. Morrison also explores ideas of freedom in this section, specifically that freedom in the United States implies equality. In other words, freedom for the black body must always be accompanied by an acceptance of inferiority. And I'll repeat that. Freedom for the black body must be accompanied by an acceptance of inferiority. Um, Morrison also underscores that race defines literature of the United States as well as the nation's identity. In part three, Disturbing Nurses and the Kindness of Sharks. She describes her interest in how blackness and the black body have been deployed in literature. Quote, my project is an effort to avert the critical gaze from the racial object to the racial subject, from the described and imagined to the describers and imaginers, from the serving to the served. In sum, the reality of race and slavery in the United States creates a rich terrain upon which white writer, writers could play in the dark. Western literature from the late 19th and early 20th centuries commonly dealt with the many complexities of the intersections between races in a changing world. It is natural then that mixed race figures would appear in these works. I would argue that the presence of these figures was no accident. With the introduction of characters that were the living embodiments of race relations in the United States, authors like Charles Chestnut, Nella Larson, William Faulkner, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, and Harriet Beecher Stowe were able to actively explore and mediate the anxieties raised by political tensions in the anti or postbellum periods around race, class, nation, and sexuality. I'm seeking to present a portrait of the mixed race individual, specifically mixed race female characters, as keys or signposts to modernist culture's fixation on race, firstly through Safira and the Slave Girl, Willa Cather's last book. Published in 1940, the author explores the concept of nation through slavery. In order to do so, she employs the mixed race woman who operates as a key figure in a melodramatic plot of abuse. 
In Safira and the Slave Girl, Cather also represents the mixed race woman's relationship to and confrontation with the construction of white womanhood. Despite deteriorating health and confinement to a wheelchair, Safira of the title powerfully controls the operations of her Back Creek farm. But there are greater implications presented by Cather's novel. There is a swollen, marked, incapacitated woman at the center of this text. And I would argue that that marked, incapacitated woman is representative of the United States, swollen with all of the unresolved complexity of slavery. Unresolved, unable to erase or effectively deal with its complicated past, the issue erupts in Back Creek, with Safira busily arranging the rape of Nancy, the slave girl of the title, finding violence to be the only way to continue controlling black bodies. It is in this tension that I explore discussions of American national identity, particularly that of a nation built on slave labor that still cannot resolve its history. Though mitigated by gender, Cather Safira is the possessor of power and privilege in the novel. Her family lineage and financial holdings make her the wealthiest person to have ever lived in Back Creek, as well as one of the only remaining slaveholders in Virginia. And though she has not resided there for more than 30 years, she is not native to the area, having come from east of the Blue Ridge Mountains. As a wealthy heiress and landowner with slaves, she sees the people native to Back Creek as simple, quote unquote, very poor people. Even her slave, Till, describes the people of Back Creek as, quote, poor, poor farmers and backwoods people. Because of their status within the community, Back Creek residents seem to be wary of Safira Colbert and her family's wealth and in influence. At the same time, the novel's residents view their whiteness as the only leveling agent in their poverty. David Fairhead, who is a preacher, um, at uh, Henry Colbert's church, and Henry Colbert is Safira's husband, observes that some of the poor mountain boys resort to stealing and petty crime rather than work alongside black laborers because of their white skin and the belief that it grants them a certain degree of privilege. He says, quote, it's the one thing they've got to feel important about, that they're white. The residents of Back Creek cling to their whiteness as a marker of their privilege over free blacks, slaves, and even more recent arrivals to the area, much like Safira exercises her privilege to be a propertyed slaveholder and arrange her household as she sees fit. Cather's portrait of the United States, as represented by Back Creek, illustrates that wealth and privilege are held, held by a limited few, and in this case, one crippled white woman. Many theorists have written about the underlying motivations for Safira's problematic plan for Nancy, ranging from an inability to act on her own lesbian desires to an attempt to enact her power. But the novel provides evidence that Safira's motivation lies in the Back, back Creek world she has constructed for herself. Very early in the text, Safira offers, quote, I ought to be allowed to arrange for Nancy's future. And why shouldn't she control Nancy's body? As Toni Morrison says in Playing in the Dark, quote, it is after all hers, this slave woman's body, in a way that her own invalid flesh is not. In a violent text articulating the struggle for women's legibility, mediating slavery's continuance in a literal United States backwater, Safira is trying to arrange a mate for Nancy as she did for the slave girl's mother. Interestingly enough, the slave girl's mother is named Till, and she is written about throughout the novel as being exceedingly loyal to Safira, even to the detriment of her relationship with her daughter. But Till's behavior can better be explained as a consequence of how slavery distorts interpersonal and particularly family relations. And due to the nature of female slavery and the difficult circumstances under which they were required to accommodate the sexual advances of white males. It's not clear that, that Till is, is or is not resisting. What does become obvious is that Safira decides to arrange for Till's um, sexual future by quote unquote marrying her off to a sterile man. Somehow, however, um, Till finds herself pregnant and it's not clear 
who the father is of her child. It is curious to contemplate that a Cuban painter who visited Back Creek over a period of a few years um, to paint portraits of the family might be Nancy's father. The only reason why I speculate this is because the novel reports conspiratorially, quote, he was a long, a long while doing them. And one wonders if this line is about the Cuban painter's portraits or his sexual liaisons with female slaves like Till whatever significance can be derived from the line. The union between Till and the portrait painter can be imagined as the only agency or defiance that Till exercised in her relationship with Safira. And regardless, Nancy's paternity is not known, the, this in spite of her resemblance to the portrait painter from Cuba. And people are continually speaking about um, um, who her father might be and, but to imagine a consensual union between two people of color destabilizes the social and legal prescriptions of slavery in the United States. The preferred narrative, because it is the one that is more commonly accepted under slavery, is that one of Henry's brothers is Nancy's father. Quote, the Colbert men had a bad reputation where women were concerned. Nancy was often counted as one of the Colbert bastards. And so if Nancy's paternity is more likely connected to the Cuban painter, um, the novel rejects it again and again. Um, certainly, this leads to uh, larger discussions of what it would mean to have a different kind of um, sexual viability in the novel for, for Till the Slave. Regardless, it's quite compelling. Um, the fact that um, many of the slave men in the novel are characterized as being impotent is also subject for discussion. That lack of masculine potency um, in relationship to the men of the novel um, suggests that the American narrative is also um, impotent and out of control and potentially unsettling. So with Jacob Colbert as Nancy's alleged father, there is a paternity story that gets written or suggested that cleaves more to the United States' narrative of miscegenous activity between black female slaves and white men. And if Nancy's father um, is Jacob Colbert, then Safira um, is trying to arrange her, for her to be raped by her cousin. The other issue that these speculations raise is regarding the ways that white people control the narrative and circumstances of black family con construction. For example, Safira, quote, married Till off to Jefferson, the sterile slave, who was many years her senior. And it's not that it was um, a secret that he was sterile. He is described as, quote, having certain incapacities that were well known among the darkies. And it is strange that she should choose a sterile man. But at the same time, she doesn't want Till to be distracted by her own sexuality or her children. What is interesting about that is that happens for a time but um, as I already said, um, she is more loyal to her mistress than to her daughter. So ultimately, the slave mother's service and congenial nature um, helped to prop up her mistress's white ladyhood, which makes it possible for the slave mistress to effect a plan for the slave girl's life. What's interesting is that it doesn't occur to Safira and to Willa Cather, who writes her into being, that Till would have feelings about her daughter's fate because everybody knows what's happening in the novel. But as Toni Morrison notes, quote, that condition could only prevail in a slave society where the mistress can count on and an author can believe the reader does not object to the complicity of the mother in the seduction and rape of her own daughter. So how does Cather come up with such an inexplicably violent text? While there's no excuse for Safira's despicable plans to arrange Nancy's future, I would locate her declining health as one motivating factor for her actions. The first descriptions of Safira's appearance place her in direct contrast to Nancy. Safira's hands are plump compared to Nancy's, quote, slender, nimble hands. And further descriptions of Safira's body indicate that she is not well. Quote, the mistress had dropsy and was unable to walk, all the more cruel in that she had been a very active woman. In these lines, the reader can understand how devastated Safira might feel about her failing health and deformed lower limbs. 
Her condition literally has her housebound and dependent on others, which in some ways might intensify her frustration of not being in control. Her level of despair might also be amplified by the realization that she has become like many 19th century women, tied to the home. Is Cather giving a portrait of the 1930s? Maybe. Safira's incapacitation and swollen legs could be indicative of the State of the Union. She is what is left over, a metaphor for incapacitated whiteness, unable to live up to the promises of its founding principles. Safira's de deteriorating condition also provides additional information for the reader. Back Creek is a white Southern utopia where slavery still exists, in which a white woman in deteriorating health can be the richest person out there. Cather's imagined Back Creek then is revealed as what is safely, safely hidden in the American imagination about race, the desire for the continued oppression of black people. There is evidence to, in the text to argue that this meditation is central to the novel and causes the kind of violence and hysteria evident in Safira's rape plan for Nancy. There's an extended bucolic description of Back Creek, making references to white flowers and trees, particularly the dogwood with their quote, singular whiteness. These are lasting memories shared by quote unquote, every Virginian, subtly evoking the shared experiences of whiteness as it relates to slavery and the subjugation of black people. Cather constructs a world in which things do make sense, a world in which an invalid mistress can oppress those around her, denying citizenship and agency to those perceived as other. In this way, Safira's actions are a perverse attempt to create a lasting slave history, especially in an isolated hamlet like Back Creek, but as I'm arguing, in the, in the deep recesses of the American cultural imagination. With all of this in mind, how do we place this work? Critics have been disquieted by Cather's racist articulation of black characters in Safira and the Slave Girl, which played a role in the lack of attention to the novel until recent years. And part of that discomfort, I think, derives from the American belief that the absence of formal legal discrimination necessarily means the absence of any further complicated or troubling issues surrounding race. There is also the belief that pointed assertions on race should not happen in polite company, and not certainly in the work of a celebrated novelist like Cather. But I would argue that Safira and the Slave Girl deserves to be part of the conversation about Cather's work, but also American cultural history, because she is writing about what people want to read, a United States that doesn't actually exist. And any illusions about Cather's intentions can, can be dispelled in her letters in which she talks about Safira and the Slave Girl and her motivations for writing the novel. She says that the novel um, and its quote, darky speech were deep down in my mind, exactly like phonograph records. These kinds of views signal Safira and a Slave Girl as a major work precisely because it's difficult and uncomfortable. No such discussions will call into question Cather's skill as an American author. In the end, Safira and the Slave Girl shows the American white woman knowing and writing about the disease of racism and the impact of slavery in the United States, leaving bare the omissions and gaps in a collective national history yet to be addressed. Discussing the historical interdependence of constructions of race and identity can also reveal the mixed race woman as a vehicle for other authors as well. Morrison also suggests that these explorations could occur in a different context. Quote, there also exists, of course, a European Africanism with a counterpart in colonial literature. I will note that this is just a parenthetical re remark that Morrison gives in the second chapter of Playing in the Dark, but it led me to Martha Gellhorn's um, Liana, another text that I'm going to be analyzing this evening. Published in 1944, Gellhorn's novel converges in the character of Liana, the eponymous mixed race heroine of the book. She is the wife of a lovely gentleman named Mark Royer, a leading businessman and landowner in the fictional French island colony of Saint Boniface. Mark marries the incredibly beautiful Liana, not out of love or affection, but as a means to exact control over something because everything is out of control on this Caribbean island. 
Liana becomes more a possession than a person. And to some degree, Mark is motivated by the feeling that he has lost the envy of other men and quote, he needed to be envied. So the decision to wed Liana is a cruel bargain because she is the most beautiful quote mulatto on the island. And he is also motivated by the fact that he could buy her in this island economy. And I'm gonna talk about um, um, the commerce that is exacted upon her body in just a little bit. Liana is described by Gellhorn as, quote, a sort of invisible freak. And, and as a mixed race woman, she, again, this is Gellhorn saying, she belongs nowhere. So Liana, like Nancy in Cather's novel, is tragically isolated. And um, the isolation of these mixed race characters further articulates their marginality and lack of belonging, even at quote unquote home. The character of Liana allows for a discussion of the movement from former colonies to independent island entities. Through a mediation on Liana, one can see the islanders, particularly her husband's tenuous connection to whiteness as a white Creole. In addition, there is an entire relationship that is constructed between Mark and Pierre. Pierre is Liana's tutor that Mark has gotten for her, and he also becomes her brief love interest. And the relationship between Mark and Pierre is based on desire by each of them for the other, for the significant and yet ancillary value that they believe the other can provide. Mark is desperate for racial legitimacy and Pierre is desperate for information on World War II, France. Um, so he's willing to lean over a crackling radio with, with Mark um, most evenings. And subsequently, his ability to return to France comes through Mark's money, which also legitimates Mark's ability um, or ability to, to connect with whiteness. And Pierre has something that Mark desperately needs, which is authentic whiteness, or to be even more plain, an authentic Frenchness. And so they strike up their own uneasy relationship based on a shared interest in the war. And Mark decides that he must save Pierre and the save and savior is throughout the book and he assists Pierre in leaving St. Boniface so that he can return to fight alongside his countrymen in Europe. This interconnection between the two men embodies the, the kind of attraction revulsion that a post-colonial theorist named Homi Baba speaks about in his discussion of the colonized and colonizer. Strikingly, in the fictional island world of St. Boniface, Gellhorn's characters live in a very delusional Caribbean peace while a war rages just across the ocean in Europe. It is worth noting that Gellhorn herself is taking a break. Um, some would argue fleeing from World War II Europe at the time that she's writing Liana. As a result, it appears that she can only see the residents of St. Boniface through the lens of 1940s Europe. So we get stock snippets of Caribbean life in this work. This this war correspondent, and I'm speaking about what Martha Gellhorn, seems obsessed with men and the war. And it becomes obvious in the attention she pays to Mark Royer and Pierre. And even though this novel is called Liana, they receive more of a multidimensional treatment than her title character. Liana is a departure from the journalistic writing for which Martha Gellhorn is more commonly known. In the summer of 1942, Gellhorn was widely known as a seasoned war correspondent, having traveled to France, Spain, Czechoslovakia, Finland, China, and the Dutch West Indies, often during heavy military occupation and battle. According to one of her biographers, Gellhorn loved the kind of life where she could, quote, put what she needed in a suitcase. She was very successful at her craft, winning the envy and admiration of her fellow male journalists on the front lines. But while this was happening, Gellhorn also began to be known as Mrs. Hemingway based on her recent marriage to the writer. And she had grown wary of the domestic tranquility of life in Cuba with her husband of two years. On assignment for Collier's Magazine in the Caribbean, reporting on military preparedness, she explored a bit and she felt unencumbered to work on this novel. And so in this novel, Gellhorn unifies competing interests and observation. She brings together her interests in reporting the fascist project and brings it head to head with the colonialist project. 
through the common lens of racially identified ideologies and motives. Now, let me be clear. These projects, as I'm calling them, had vastly different motives. The National Socialist Party had, on the one hand, the immediate obliteration of Jews. And on the other, European colonizers fancied the prolonged subjugation of brown-skilled people. I think that this is an amazing sort of lift that Gellhorn is trying to affect in this text. And so I respect her motivations for bringing together colonialism and war, because at times she does it quite skillfully. At the same time, she's leveling critiques against all the players in this colonial drama, including herself. So I'm going to articulate the ways that Gellhorn actually becomes complicit in the subjugation of the colonized other in this characterization of Liana. So St. Boniface is a French Caribbean colony isolated from other island colonies as well as French resistance efforts. In the 1986 afterward to the novel, Gellhorn states that she, quote, settled in imagination on the perfect island rather than reporting the war. If the island is indeed perfect, then Gellhorn is providing rich material of her own role in the colonial project. Liana is sold to Mark um, for the paltry land and monthly allowance on which her family containing four other children live. As she's written, her mother thinks that this is a natural, um, a natural decision for her to make. Um, she takes stock of Liana's assets as if to explain why she would sell her daughter and why her daughter is responsible to finance herself and her siblings future. She does not appear to have a natural affection for her daughter, Liana. She says, quote, none of them are light colored as, as Liana. None of them had a white father to give them loosely curling hair and a small pretty nose. Only Liana has a chance like a white girl. So Gellhorn suggests that Liana and her mother, Lucy, lack the affection that typifies a mother-daughter affection for each other, or what we would, we would say typifies a mother-daughter affection. Why does she do that? Gellhorn herself enjoyed a close relationship with her mother, leaving Hemingway for months at a time, sometimes to visit her. So the author is not likely motivated from a lack of positive mother-daughter relationships in her life. But Gellhorn writes Liana as alienated from her mother and as from her siblings, and the larger community in St. Boniface, which Gellhorn tells us is very diverse. She says that every household had a cocoa colored um, relative in it. This relationship is very reminiscent of Cather's musings about Till and Nancy in Sapphira and the Slave Girl. Cather, as well as Gellhorn, are unable to imagine intimacies between black mothers and daughters. I think we then have to question Gellhorn's motivations in depicting her heroine in an unfavorable manner in this so-called perfect novel. Gellhorn has long sections noting stereotypical descriptions of, 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 of shacks and by extension, blacks in general. Quote, the morning air did not wash out the smell of the room. It kept the odor of their bodies and their beds, their food, the creeping smell that came in from the latrine, which was too near the house and the sharp rotten smell of the garbage dump. Liana is described as being quote, sickened by her own people and she is repulsed by her own family. Is Gelhorn expecting the reader to be repulsed by Liana's family or by extension, are we supposed to be repelled by black people? Because she seems to be uncritically contrasting a white way of living where Liana lives with Mark in town and a black way of living, which is characterized by the shacks. Liana becomes alienated in her family as well because she is half white. Her siblings see her to use phrases from the text as beautiful and rare, lovely and strange, in essence, different from them, something foreign. And through these descriptions, Liana is juxtaposed with other blacks, particularly the women in her family she is not white, she is not black, she is not male, and without clear allegiances, she should just disappear. So where the author Gellhorn is able to play in the dark, Liana has to be destroyed for her time in whiteness. What is striking at the conclusion is that the two men who have used Liana for their sexual pleasure and gratification are able to go home ostensibly. 
Mark is able to claim his identity, hopefully permanently, in St. Boniface, and Pierre is able to go home because Mark finances his trip. But Liana, who is home, cannot remain there. Once called, quote, as beautiful as the island, Liana no longer belongs there. Quote, she was now this woman who belonged nowhere, belonged nowhere and had no place to go. Caught in the trap of society's anxieties, we hear that, quote, what she did now was natural and she kills herself. What does this mean really? And what do we do with that? Why is there such a violence toward this character in the text? But what if we looked at it another way? What if Liana is a stand-in for Gellhorn herself? It then becomes an interesting exercise to imagine how Gellhorn, an ardent feminist, imagined herself in relationship to her husband, Ernest Hemingway. I would imagine that she fashioned herself and thought of herself as Hemingway's e equal. But what did Hemingway think about his accomplished, well-respected wife? Interestingly enough, they quarreled quite a bit. And as their quarrels increased, he famously shouted at her, quote, they'll be reading my stuff long after the worms have finished with you. So when Gellhorn writes that Liana is, quote, not even a woman, a beautiful mindless animal, what is she really talking about here? Is this reflective of the, the life that she um, is fleeing in Cuba, that she is frustrated with, with her husband? Hard to say, but she reduces Liana to an extension of the untamed natural landscape of this created Caribbean island, and Liana becomes a non-issue. She's non-human. So one must wonder if Gellhorn sacrifices Liana to avoid becoming a Liana. In her foray into the fictionalized former colony of St. Boniface, Gellhorn embodies the colonizer's sexist and racist policies in the execution, in all senses of the word, of Liana. Gellhorn is deeply enmeshed in a sentimental tale of longing for the days when a small ruling class of white people controlled the lives of others. But it would be dangerous to dismiss Liana as a nostalgic throwback to days long gone by. As an American author herself, she is linked to Cather's project of exploring the changing value of whiteness. That we have two white female writers making use of black characters in the late 1930s for their own motivations is striking. It's also nothing new perhaps, but texts like Safira and the Slave Girl and Liana exemplify the confrontation of the mixed race female character with whiteness and reveals the un underlying discussions on race, sexuality, and nation. Cather and Gellhorn's characters are the physical manifestation of significant national anxieties. In the end, as Morrison notes, authors have a particular responsibility to the characters they create. Quote, an author is not personally accountable for the acts of his fictive creatures, although he is responsible for them. The figure of the mixed race or marginalized woman allows for a nuanced kind of textual exploration that deserves to be discussed along with Cather and Gellhorn's respective works. Moreover, I'm going to suggest tonight, maybe rather boldly, that these texts can be used in different ways to construct a continuum to more recent fictions. At the core of this pronouncement is the acknowledgement of the tenuous nature of racial constructions in the era of post-race political correctness. I'm sorry to move you from my early 20th century world into the 21st century. I'm feeling that these ideas about race and freedom and equality are no more evident than in the racial construction of President Barack Obama. While Obama's mixed raceness made him palatable and therefore electable to the United States voting public, upon his election, he became the first black president. As a mixed race or black person, his presence in the White House hindered conversation because he is a symbol of racism's end. And yet we know his racial story is illegible. So it becomes in essence illegal. We see renewed these kinds of anxieties around Democratic vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Is she a legitimate American? Though born in the Bay Area, which is part of the United States, there are tiring and time consuming questions about her citizenship. Senator Harris's foreign born parents, 
from possibly S-hole countries like Jamaica and India, and her mixed race identity render her illegible in a stereotypically racialized American narrative. Yet here we see a mixed race female who is no longer cut off from her community. In addition to her sister Maya, she has a squad of women that quote, have her back. Obama and Harris's presence destabilize and unhinge core beliefs about race in the United States, a reminder of the paucity of our public mediated discourse on race. And as Morrison warns us in playing in the dark, be mindful of the terror of human freedom. So though I am dancing on the fine line between literature and real life, I would posit that fictional meditations and mediations can yield insights on the tensions surrounding race, identity, and citizenship in our, in our contemporary world. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Williams, that was great. And possibly start my video, we'll see. I don't think we're able to see your video just yet. I think you would have to um, um, allow me to. I've already stopped. I've already showed my my video, so you would have to to to, to permit me to, to be seen. But I'm also happy to be a disembodied voice. Trust <laughs> me. And try turning on your camera now. I'm not sure why it's not working, but I guess you could be a disembodied. I can be a disembodied <laughs> voice for now. Yeah. Let me see if it works now. It wants to somehow. <laughs> it's not though. It's okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, oh there we go. Da, da, da. There I am. <laughs> Are there any questions out there? Did I lull them into like slumber? No, no. I had a question about um. I know you can't really get into it, but I was curious about the Huck Finn aspect of it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So what's interesting about about Huckleberry Finn? is that, um, and using Morrison's reading, is that Jim, the slave, cannot be thought of as a full human because um, freedom can only be conceived of through this little boy. And what's interesting about that is that a little boy is able to light out on his own, as the novel says. He lights out on his own for new territory. And Jim is too connected to family and he's described as being quite oblique. And then according to Morrison, it just kind of falls apart because Jim is given a little bit of humanity, but then it's taken away from him as well um, because a grown man doesn't have agency. He doesn't have the ability to seek his own freedom, but a child, a white male child can. So a white male child has more agency and freedom than, um, than an adult black male, which leads her to this larger discussion of freedom and how we are constantly talking about freedom in the United States and really resonated with me as I was preparing for this evening, how people are talking about their rights a lot lately and how they feel that their rights are being impinged upon. Um, but um, the freedom as freedom as Morrison articulates it, and I think that she's right, freedom is the province of white people. And so Jim can't be free because that th threatens to upend whiteness. Um, because whiteness is, freedom is only allowed through whiteness. Um, if you are free and of color, or in this case, a black person, then you must be subservient. And you cannot have your own, you cannot think for yourself. And that's why the text, the text renders Jim um, unable to, to think for himself or act for himself. It gives you a different lens, 
of how to look at Huckleberry Finn because it is an American classic, but like she would say that she's not trying to um, undo um, the place of Huckleberry Finn in the American canon, but rather to show that it's, there's, there are other layers to, to it as well. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so Josh, Joshua Leach says, I would love for you to expand on the need for texts like Liana and passing the tragic mulatto to end their life in order to restore balance. Hmm. I would ask Joshua Leach to, to, to give me a little bit more information. Are you saying, because a text like Liana is different than a text like Passing, because in, in Passing, the characters are, the characters are, well, the main character is Passing to achieve whiteness. Basically, um, she's trying to, to, to bypass the black middle class in order to, to access the, the privilege of, of white womanhood, essentially. Um, and so um, if we're talking about, but I think your question really is about, is about why these characters get killed off. And I could, talk, I could talk forever on that because I think that they are so dangerous because of, of the position they occupy at the nexus of black and white encounters that, they, that writers get to a certain point in imagining them and cannot find a way forward for them. They can't, they can't push them forward into personhood. They can't fully have them exercise their rights because the country or the, the, the country, the backdrop of the countries that are, that are imagined or real won't allow for these women to, to have um, access. And so I like to think that Larson killed killed off um, Claire Kendry um, to save her from having to be around all those trifling people in the rest of that novel. Um, because it's hard to imagine what happens to Claire if she's able to continue. Um, I would like for her to continue, but it's hard to imagine within the world of the novel how Claire continues because she, can, she threatens to upend everything that the novel is built upon everything about the black middle class um, and how it's constructed in its mimicry of the white upper middle class is threatened by Claire Kendry's life. So that's why I think she loses it. That's fascinating because, yeah, I, feel, I see that when I read books that they tend to kill off the women characters. It's interesting. Always good stuff. I mean, I don't like it, but, no. <laughs> but like, because then, you know, I don't like it, but then it gives me a lot to talk about, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and Passing is one of my favorite books. If I'd had my druthers, I'd probably include Passing tonight, but, you know, give Larson a rest for now. Gotcha. Um, David, if you want to answer your question again, um, raise your hand again and I'll allow you to talk. But until then, I'm going to skip to Sandra. She says, this was great. What was interesting to me was how white women use black bodies to tell their stories. Do you think it is a lack of freedom for these women in, these situa in their situation? that causes these women to use black women as their own escape? Possibly. I think that's an interesting, an interesting um, speculation. Um, with regard to Cather, um, I think that, I mean, Cather had had a very celebrated career at that point, and, but, but she was also in declining health. And so I guess one could read into Safira Cather's fears about her own declining health, but I really think that it's synonymous with what's going on in the US. Like she's writing in the 1930s, but setting a novel some 50 years prior in Bat Creek, where most people don't know, that's actually where Cather was born in Bat Creek, Virginia. I had the pleasure, I mean it, the pleasure of visiting her childhood home in 2019. And it was utterly fascinating to see the home that she was rendering in Safira and the slave girl, her bedroom and the slave quarters. I mean, all of it, it was just utterly fascinating. So I think that it helps perhaps her to render her feelings about, about perhaps her, her own declining health, but also the, what's happening in the United States at that time um, with regard to Jim Crow segregation, race, whiteness, et cetera, reconstruction, post-reconstruction and what's happening abroad. 
I think something similar is happening for Gellhorn. I'm suggesting, although, you know, um, I don't know it to be true that that Gellhorn was was I know Gellhorn in her in her papers in her letters she was talking about being frustrated, and for someone who had traveled the world um, as one of the boys basically like to be hanging out in Cuba it doesn't sound bad to hang out in Cuba but she's hanging out with Hemingway who's largely ignoring her most of the time because he's talking with other men. And she's tired of it. Like they had a very passionate love affair initially, and then things sort of went south. Um, and so she's itching to get out of there. But I wonder, is is this rendering of Liana like related to her feelings about um, about marriage and relationships, or like her disaffection with marriage at the time? Hard to say. Um, but there's enough in there that that makes it ripe for for speculation and you know I, I wonder about how um, um, they try to use these black women's bodies as a way to meditate on their own conditions and then like I said it gets to a certain point and they can't continue so they've got to like in the case of Cather get rid of them like Nancy Nancy's out of the picture um, um, and is helped to escape and Liana is, is killed off. Um, we've got a couple more in the Q&A, actually, we've got quite a bunch. Um, David asks, one comment, how ironic is that Black women and thus Blackness are not, do not differ and or in fear that Caucasians, male characters, and other related author would refuse to copulate with and as unintentionally birth figuratively, literally, and literary offspring? And then, um, Nina says, thank you so much for your eliminating presentation. I wanted to know about your thoughts about white womenhood <laughs> and white female authorship as expressed in Cather and Gellhorn and the current tension between white women, i.e. the Karens and the Amy's and black bodies as we see today. Are there contemporary writers who you see struggling with these issues even today? Hmm. I, I can't think of anyone offhand who is struggling with the Karens and the Amy's, but isn't it lovely that we have Karen and Amy to deal with in real life is what I would say. Um, this may be off topic. I have read criticisms recently about black lists of books, movies, etc., to help educate people about racism because they focus on books and movies that highlight suffering. What do you think about this? What do you, would Tori Mar Tony Morrison think about this? Um, so let me let me try to interpret that question. Are you saying that there's been criticism? If you're saying that there's been criticism about creating a list of books or movies that are essential for understanding whiteness and like you know how to get more woke, Morrison might find that somewhat problematic. I, I suppose I would never want to speak for Miss Morrison because I would love for her to be speaking and I hear her voice all the while, like saying things through her novels and her nonfiction and her speeches. But I mean. I think that it is always problematic for us to approach um, any issue as here are the top three things that you need to read. You know, it, this goes, I mean, this is not just for issues about race and believe me, I'm not trying to be facetious, but you know, here are the top three products to make your skin look good. Here are the top three things to eat. Here are the seven things that you should do to improve your life. and it's much the same. If you read these three books or you watch these three movies, um, you, will, you will have a good understanding of race. But the other, there's another part to that question, which I'm going to interpret, which is to say that while I would not want to speak for Ms. Morrison, she might say that it is a good thing for people who might benefit the most from whiteness in our society to do some of the work. Because as she has said in multiple forums, um, I didn't create racism. I didn't create it, like you did. Like, I'm not interested. Like, I'm not interested, you do this. Like, you take this on. So I'm interpreting that question a couple of different ways. Um, and Angela asks, is it possible that Mark Twain couldn't conceive of Jim having the agency to be free and so he writes him as he does. Is the limitation Twain lacks of imagination or open-mindedness? Did Jim or real people like him not experience freedom in his own mind? 
Mark Twain, Mark Twain is not suffering from a lack of, of talent. So no, I don't, I don't think that Mark Twain um, um, writes Jim in a particular kind of way because he can't imagine it. I think he can't imagine it because that's, it's not Jim's story. It's Huck's story. Jim is an add-on that allows Huck to have someone interesting, like a sidekick, to, to sort of operate against, to, to speak more plainly. Without Jim, you don't see how, you're, you're not, you don't see how amazing it is as a reader um, that this little boy is on his own. Without Jim, it's just, there's just this little boy, like leaving home, leaving an abusive family um, situation with Pap and like on his own. That kind of story makes people uncomfortable. Like that there's this child on his own, like having to figure things out for himself. But you put the kindly slave in Jim and that becomes a more familiar narrative because Jim is going to take care of him, isn't he? Because that's what black people do. We're supposed to caretake. So Jim is a Jim is an add on. He is um, and he's he's there to be familiar. So he cannot possibly um, be seeking his own freedom. Um, and I mean, honestly, that kind of characterization is in line with so many novels and movies that articulate that black people do not seek freedom. They don't want freedom for themselves. And if you go back to slave narratives, like if you go back to a slave narrative, like um, Mary Prince's slave narrative, which is the first slave narrative written in English, um, period, she says to be free is very sweet. Um, and so that's where it starts, where, where people are articulating that there is nothing redeeming about being in slavery um, or being an enslaved person. And so the idea that, that, that individuals would, would choose to remain slaves rather than, um, or choose to not fight for their freedom is very odd particularly as you have an enlightenment surge in the United States that is talking about personal freedom. That's the thing that's so incredible about the United States. You have the rise of enlightenment ideals and notions about personal freedom and the contract of being an American up against the utter subjugation of black people and the, and while the triangular slave trade has stopped in the United uh, and the United States has stopped participating in the triangular slave trade, the U.S. derived its own system of chattel slavery in order to continue to propagate black bodies. It's utterly fascinating. Long answer, but that's how I, that's how I would address it. Good answer. Um... Forgive me if I asked this, if I read this before, I'm getting, I'm going back and forth, but um, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> additionally, can you speak to some of the parallels that exist between Morrison's Tar Baby? Did I read this one already? No. Okay. And Liana, around the protagonists, their beauty based on exotic posi positioning of their racial ambiguity and how their bodies are policed in a way by various gazes. Well, um, the first thing I'll say is that Tar Baby is one of those novels of Morrison's that doesn't get read enough. Um, for whatever reason, and I don't know if it's because it takes place partially off-site, um, but for those of you that haven't read it, I encourage you to read it because there was a time when I taught my seminar on Toni Morrison and Tar Baby had gone out of print. I can't even imagine it, um, that Tar Baby would ever, any, any, of, any of Morrison's novels would go out of print. In any event, there are parallels in, in how the authors construct these noisy Caribbean islands. And I'm, I don't mean noisy in terms of sound. I mean noisy in terms of the plant life and the bustle of the landscape and then putting people in that environment. The difference between Tar Baby and Liana is that the bulk of the protagonists of Liana are from there, their home. Whereas um, in Tar Baby, um, you have people who are migrating from the US um, to live in this island paradise that is being curated by Valerian Street. Um, 
um, who is like the kind of a rainmaker, let's say, in the novel. Um, and Valerian, I mean, everything comes back to Valerian Street, but he's also, um, it's complicated, but like <laughs> Valerian is a type of can uh, candy sludge. And it's funny that like his, that's the name of this main character who is literally holding back various individuals in the text, like his black um, butler type person and his black maid type person. Um, they aren't, and, and Morrison is very, it's very curious how she renders them, but her, her focus is Jadine. Um, um, and um, who is a model and the niece of Sin Sydney and Andine, um, this maiden, um, the butler and maid, respectively. Thanks. Um, Sharon had a comment. I'm not sure what she was commenting on, but she says, I agree. Having read about her notoriety and Hemingway's jealousy, she needs to find her own place to be recognized. She was recognized, but there was just, I think it was tough. I think she had to get out of there. And she did. I think she had to get back to the war. I mean, they weren't married very, very long, but it was a lot. There was a lot going on for her at that time. I think it was very, very hard. Um, Peg says, it's like the minstrality. They've been making black talent and culture, allowing them to feel less reserved. It was a fascinating observation. Thank you. And then I think this is the last one. Let me just double check. Um, Sharon says, it is too hard to see Blacks in any other way than what society narr narratives tell us. It is too scary for me to see Black people as anything other than the narratives that were sold to by everyone. I would agree. Um, I think that's why we're, we're seeing, um, I think people are um, very disturbed by the images that we see on the news, if you're still watching news. Um, of protests and counter protests and counter counter protests and the rhetoric that is being articulated. Um, I suggested around Kamala Harris, but also just like, is it, is it okay for people to peacefully protest? And we're seeing that only certain people can peacefully protest. So I do think Morrison is correct that something like peaceful protests or, or um, freedom is the province of white people. Um, and, and you can see that, for example, in, in the controversy, it feels so long ago now, around Colin Kaepernick's decision to, to kneel, um, which to me is a symbol of humility, but for some unknown reason, his decision to say, at, like, I can recognize this flag, but this flag is also being used in a manner that is violent toward um, individuals who look like me. And so I'm going to take a knee on that. Um, and how he still, he still doesn't have um, a job in the NFL, but how that has, how that has seemed to be indicative of, of um, black agency and a, a kind of, um, oh, it's like hard, it's hard to even say like, like a black gratitude for being allowed to live in the United States. Um, so um, I think Morrison is correct. I, if you haven't read this text, um, I would suggest reading the, the second chapter, which is about freedom and know that it is about, you know, it's a little bit about Edgar Allan Poe, um, but it's a little bit about Huckleberry Finn and you will see these, like, these one-off lines that talk about freedom and how freedom and citizenship are only granted to some. And most of us, um, according to how freedom is constructed presently, cannot fully participate in, in that freedom. Thank you so much. Um, any last questions or comments from anybody? Well, thank you again for coming. Um, thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank you. Um, oh. Yeah. Yes, Sandra says, thank you, this was <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Take care now. See you soon, Tracy. Be well. You too.